Hey there, everyone. And a happy Thanksgiving to all. Sarah, Delaney, and myself are taking the week off to celebrate the holiday. But I know many of you are road tripping to grannies. Or itching to hear something spooky while dressing the bird. So tonight, I'm dusting off an old Monsters Among Us Beyond episode. All the way from back in November of 2020. Thanksgiving week, to be precise. And all before I push play on this past episode, I rounded the nights up for a, another night at the round table recently. This goofy little review show that I occasionally do with my friends, David Flora of Blurry Photos Podcast, and Justin Zenger of Zengbass. Well, this week we discussed the newer documentary, The Unbinding, from Greg and Dana Newkirk. Now you can catch that episode for free over on our Patreon page. Just go to patreon.com and search for Monsters Among Us podcast. And you can even listen without creating an account. Just scroll past the membership options at the beginning of the page. And you'll find it listed down there. Now, let's get on with tonight's show. A happy Thanksgiving to everyone. And please enjoy this blast from the past. The Unlock of Monsters Among Us Beyond, number 39. Welcome to Monsters Among Us Beyond, number 39. I am your guide, Derek Hayes. Welcome Patreon subscribers and happy Thanksgiving to all here in the States. It's great to have you here with us this evening. I have a great program lined up for you guys this evening. And since I'm behind on the release schedule, let's just go ahead and dive in. We're going to kick this evening off with a ghostly tale out of the Keystone State. Please welcome Christian from Pennsylvania to the program. Hi, my name is Christian from PA. I called before about a tree getting knocked down in the woods. This is a different story. I was working at a packing factory. We were packing jewelry. It's a huge company on the East Coast. Actually, it's global now, and um, but it started out on the East Coast and in Pennsylvania, but um, we would do shift work. So on second shift on a SAF, Friday and a Saturday night, you were alone on the pack floor. Basically, you were just going through the machines, making sure they were working for the next day, and you're on an old building. It's called Building 3. It was the oldest part of the building, and then the rest of it was all additions on put onto that. This was a pack floor warehouse area. So I'm alone on the second floor, and this was the middle of summer, and I'm working on the machines, and I see something walk by, and I look over, it's like a white blur. What would happen was for security would come up on the pack floor because it was a jewelry pack floor. So they would walk, they'd do their routes and do their rounds and walk through. So I'd look, go out and call their name, hey, yo, anybody there? And nobody would answer, and I'm go back to what I was doing. I'm like, well, what was it? Whatever. So this kept going on for over a year. And I always had a feeling, like a creepy feeling, whenever it happened. So there's two buildings to this. There's one building that that's, you know, the administration, and there's one pack floor. So on a Friday, this particular Friday, I wasn't alone. I was with somebody else. His job was, he was the painter, and I was in the administration part, doing something totally different, working on air conditioners. He calls me up hysterical 
from the pack floor. It was called the Volt on the first floor. He, he's so rattled and, and about to cry. So he tells me um, that he had moved everything off the wall to paint, you know, to prep for painting, sanding, and getting ready. Um, he moved desks, chairs, about 45 items off the wall, three feet back. He was sanding everything, getting it prepped up, and then he went to go get the paint. And when he comes back, everything's put back the way it was. He ran out of there full speed, scared to death, told me he's never working in there again. Okay, whatever. That's, you know, whatever. That was odd. I wasn't sure what he was doing, if it was, you know. But I could tell that he was scared to the core. So another four or five months pass. Same thing happens to me again. Someone walks by. I see him in the corner of my eye. I look. I follow. There's no one there. So at the end of the night, I'm wrapping up. And I go down to the security desk, and I say, what is up with Building 3? What's up there? And without missing a beat, the head security guy who's been there 30 years, he goes, oh, what do you mean, the farm boy? I'm like, what? He's like, well, this used to be on a farm. The whole area was on a farm, and there's a farm boy who haunts that floor. Doesn't so much haunt it. Well, I guess he does haunt it, but he just walks it. I mean, putting the stuff back was kind of creepy. But So then he proceeds to tell me about a story that... Years before, that floor was open 24 hours a day. And then sometimes it would get real dead and most of the shift would leave. And this is like middle of the night, 4 o'clock in the morning. There was a lady who would stay down there in a, in a desk. And she said, you're sitting at a desk one day. And she looks over. It, it, the, the image walks straight up to her. It's that white, ghosty-looking image. And then it materializes into a, just a straight-up farm boy. She screamed, ran out of the building, and never came back. So that's my story of the farm boy in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Love your show. Love your podcast. Keep it up. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Another one of those classic ghost stories. Now, I actually drove through that area once. I remember it feeling very historic. So a story such as this does little to surprise me. But what it lacks in surprise, it makes up for in mystery. Who was that boy? Why did he appear as a white blur to some and a full-bodied apparition to others? And I suppose, most importantly, what was he doing there? You know, this wouldn't be the first time a strange, ghostly boy was witnessed in the Westchester area. Malcolm Johnstone of the Chester County Cultural Alliance Program as a story for us that seems to share a few parallels with Christian's entry. Check it out. In September of 1777, the Battle of Brandywine was fought just south of Westchester between General George Washington and General Howe. The British won the battle and began to prepare to take over the city of Philadelphia. General George Washington took the remainder of his troops up to Valley Forge and spent the winter there. The rest, of course, is history. But right after the battle, there was a squad of scouts. Uh, They were used to check out the whereabouts of enemy soldiers. They had gathered up, uh, left the battleground, and came up the road into Westchester, hoping to get a little bit of refreshment at the Turk's Head Inn, which was located on High Street right in downtown. Not far away from a schoolhouse, in fact, just a half a block away. And the schoolhouse was used as a battlefield hospital. This was good for the scouts. A couple of them had minor wounds and they managed to get themselves fixed up. Went down to the Turk's Head uh, for a little bit of refreshment, but they thought it would be a very good idea if one of the scouts kept guard to ensure that no more British soldiers were on their way into town. So the fellow who got the short straw perched himself over on High Street just south of what would be Market Street and he was very tired, exhausted from the battle and could barely stay awake. Indeed, he found himself nodding off. Just in time, there was a sound in his ear, the sound that sounded like a child, a child warning him that the British were coming. 
a child that woke him up and said, your friends are in grave danger and need to be rousted. The scout awoke with a start, looked around. He could not see any British soldiers. Then he heard the shouts of Hessen soldiers who were very loud during their attacks and the hooves of their horses. He had just enough time to get up to the inn where his friends were staying and get them to get themselves out of town as quickly as possible, which they did. They mounted their horses and they were actually chased to the north of town. They decided to break up, each one going in a different direction. And this confused the Hessens. They were in no mood to be chasing scouts uh, throughout a darkened countryside. So they themselves stopped. But who was this little voice that helped the scout warn his companions? It could only have been a guardian angel. He could see no other beings throughout that time. And from that point forward, he would say a prayer every night before he retired. A prayer that would be taken up to the heavens on the wings of his guardian angel. The link from this video, found in the show notes on this post, also includes four other stories from that area if this sort of thing has you wanting more. Thank you again, Christian, for sharing your entry. Now, folks, it is rebuttal time. But first, here's a shortened version of Heather's entry, all the way back from Season 7, Episode 13. And the relevance here you'll realize in just a few moments. Hi, Derek. Uh, My name is Heather. This did happen in my childhood. It was the early 90s, and I was definitely no older than maybe four or five years old. So we decided, uh, me and this girl, that we were going to go hang out in this tent that I had for some reason. And um, so I had this tent, and we put it at the, the edge of this dirt area, and so sort of like at the ledge where the woods began. And we were in there and we, you know, took some board games and coloring books and whatever else and we're just playing and just doing our thing. And um, my back was maybe a few inches away from one of the walls of the tent. So the girl that was babysitting me, I noticed that she was looking at something above my shoulder. So I turned around and I saw this curved claw thing poking into the top side of the tent. We'd noticed before this happened that everything was very quiet, didn't hear anything approach the tent, and there was a definite sense of, you know, instinctual fear that took over. So we watched it for, I don't know, probably just a few seconds, but, you know, it always feels like much longer. And so it was poking into the tent, and then it just stopped and went away. Like, the only thing that I could really logically chalk it up to is maybe, like, a bird of prey hovering above the tent with a talon poking into it, but there was no sound um, and it was just this singular one. It wasn't like several talons. I still cannot figure out what it might be. I'm very familiar with local wildlife in that area and nothing really makes sense to me that what it could be. And now, this installment's rebuttal submitted anonymously from the state of Tennessee. Hi, Derek. I'm calling about Season 7, Episode 13. I definitely have what I think is a real answer for what caller Heather described in her story about a claw poking into her tent. Now, I don't remember where Heather's call took place, but I will tell you a story that my husband told me from the Davy Crockett National Forest over here by where I live, an unmaintained part of the forest. He is a big hunter and he went out there for at least three days when he was bow hunting in the beginning of the season a few years ago. And him and his buddy who hunt everything, I mean everything you can hunt year round, if it's out of season they're hunting turtles. And um, my husband was going with them and they went out there in the woods. Three days they didn't hear a single thing just like she was describing, not hearing anything. And that is textbook all hunters know around my area that that's a big cat if you stop hearing birds if you stop hearing things like that then it means that there's a predator around 
And that predator was probably a big cat. She probably couldn't hear it, you know, because it was quiet. The cliff on the other side, that would describe that since they're um, known to be great mountain climbers, these big cats. And, you know, some say melanistic mountain lions, whatever you want to call them. But that's a lot more understandable than some kind of dinosaur velociraptor claw or whatever she described it as. And I know it would feel like it was that large. And it really probably was. And it would still be accurate as a big cat. So I just had to put that out there. And hopefully um, that answers any questions she had. Sounds like she was in danger, but it was a real danger. So hope you can use this. Thanks. Thank you, caller. I actually don't know where Heather's story took place, but our caller's suggestion makes about as much sense as anything else. I suppose even a bobcat's claw would look large in that situation, and I've certainly observed our own cats pulling a similar maneuver. They'll hook one single claw into their scratch board and sort of stretch out that single toe. So who knows? Could be a cat. Could be... I guess a dinosaur. Although I'm going to agree with our caller here and say that only one of those options is even remotely likely. Thanks again, caller, for sharing your rebuttal. Quick, look in the sky. Randall has something he'd like us to see. Hey, how y'all doing? Uh, my name's uh, Randall, and I've just started listening to your podcast, but uh, I was going to tell you my story. This happened in uh, West Tennessee around 2012. I was actually uh, on a week's vacation from work, and um, I was at my nanny and papa's house, and they live in a little town called Savannah, Tennessee. And where they live at, um, they own a bunch of property, and behind their land is uh, a bunch of TVA land. This is in the middle of nowhere. You don't even get cell service out there. So uh, at the time, my, my Uncle Pat had, uh, you know, a bunch of chickens and roosters. And um, he had told me before they left the house, can you uh, listen out for my, my roosters and stuff now because the coyotes were out. So I told me, yeah, no problem. So my uncle leaves, and it's just me, my nanny, and my papa. And uh, my papa ended up going to bed because he goes to bed pretty early. So it's just me and my nanny. Well, for some reason, and I don't know why I've done this, but my nanny and papa have, like, these big handheld spotlights that they... Uh, you know, keep her on the house and stuff like that. So I decided to grab one of them spotlights and go down there by the barn where his roosters and chickens are and kind of, I don't know, look around, I guess. So, you know, as I, as I get down there, I'm standing there and um, just kind of, you know, looking up in the sky and stuff, looking around. And I got this big spotlight on me. And I look up in the sky and this is like during like April or May. So it, it was real nice out that night and it, a bunch of stars out and stuff so I'm looking up and I see this red ball of light way up in the sky and I don't know why I've done this but for some reason I flashed it three times with the spotlight one, two, three and as soon as I lowered my head and looked straight ahead right in front of me is the barn right in back of the barn is where the woods start right above the trees this craft just appeared and literally this thing just appeared out of like another dimension or portal man it had like this aurora of colors around it It seemed like purple and pink and blue i know it sounds kind of crazy but and inside these colors it had like almost like specks of like metallic it was really weird but it was crazy is i don't really you know can describe you know what the craft looked like the only thing that and what really freaked me out was the middle of it was egg shaped but what the crazy thing is what really blew my mind was on each side of this craft, it appeared with two huge beams of light, one on each side on the bottom, and these beams were huge, like in the, the, the wideness of them. And it was like a light I've never seen before, and I can't explain it, and I've never seen it since. But this craft like appears right above the, the trees as I'm looking at it, it just appears with the, the two beams of light on it, and so it is probably about 100 feet above the trees, but the way this thing moved, it just kind of lower down into the woods, but it moved like it was in slow motion. It, to me, it was like like gravity didn't exist around this thing. That's the best way I can describe it. And I was just in shock and, and awe. I couldn't believe it. I was just standing there like, oh my God, you know, what did I just see? And, you know, I get back to the, to the house and, you know, I walk back into the house. My nanny's in there watching the news. She's like, you know, you okay, son? And I was like, you ain't gonna believe what I just seen. So I drew out, you know, a little description of what I seen, but you know, but uh, thank you and I enjoy the show. Bye. 
Thanks, Randall. I remember watching Unsolved Mysteries as a kid, the episode where they told the story of the Wabash incident, the alien abduction of three art students camping in the Maine wilderness. You see, that story began when one of the campers decided to shine their high-powered spotlight at a strange light they saw hovering over the lake. The next thing they knew, they had misplaced several hours of time. So Randall, and I suppose anyone else considering blasting a UFO with half a million candle power of LED light, maybe you should think again. Unless, of course, you're hoping for some sort of free ride. Thanks again, Randall, for the entry. Now, our next tale of the evening was sent in by Ivy. Ivy, the floor is yours. Hi, this is Ivy again. Um, I've called once or so before. Anyways, I'll get into the story. So, uh, I lived in this one-story house for about 10 years, and a couple of things had happened in that house, but the layout of the house is if you were to walk into the door and look to your right, you would see our kitchen and our dining room. If you were to go straight, you would walk into our li- living room, and then if you were to go turn left, you would go down a hallway. And in this hallway, on the left was the bathroom, and on the right was my bedroom and my younger sister's room, and my two brothers' room. So I was left home with my little sister, I thought. My mom had told me that she was being bad, so she was stuck in our bedroom. And I said, that's fine, whatever. I was watching TV, and I know it was winter. I can't tell you exactly what time, but I know it was winter just because it had the clear wraps on the window. I don't know what they're called. So I know it was winter time. I was around 13 or 14 years old because I could start babysitting at this point. And our doors were really creaky. I don't know why, but they were. So there was no sneaking out of a bedroom. If you started to open the door, it would creak and squeak and make all sorts of noises. So I heard our back bedroom door start to open up. So I hollered at my younger sister. I said, mom's gone. If you want to come out of the bedroom and come watch TV with me, that's fine. I don't mind. And I waited a couple minutes and I didn't hear anything. Well, then all of a sudden the bedroom door slams closed. Like, I mean, slams hard enough where the picture on the wall, I could hear it bump the wall, which isn't uncommon for her. She slams the door a lot because she gets mad. So I yelled back at her, fine, don't come out then. I think an hour or so later, my mom, my two brothers, my sibling's dad walks in, and then behind them, my little sister. And I said, Mom, I thought you left her home with me. And she said, no, she was being good, so I just took her. And I walked back in that bedroom thinking, well, maybe somebody had taken the cellophane or whatever off the window and opened the window. But the windows were closed. Nobody was in the room. Nobody was in the house with me at the time. So, I don't know. I just, it kind of creeped me out. But at that point, I had quite a bit of weird stuff happen to me. So, I figured it was just kind of normal. But, yeah, no, that's my story. (laughs) Okay, bye. Thanks, Ivy. I believe the plastic cellophane you're referring to is just the winter weather barrier nearly every Midwesterner applies to their windows for at least six months out of the year. Which, if applied correctly, should eliminate the draft needed to open then slam the door. It's certainly some spooky stuff. So thank you for taking the time to share it with us. And on that note, if you would like to share your true paranormal story, simply call the hotline at 1-888-608-NIGHT. That's 1-888-608-6444. Now our next terrifying tale takes us to the Sunshine State. The following was submitted by Elisa from the state of Florida. Hi, 
Hi, Derek. My name's Elisa. I've called in once before to report the one and only time I saw an unexplained creature who was uh, in the same area that I'm about to describe. Um, I didn't give you the particulars of where I was um, because I was running after hours in a preserve that had, you know, technically speaking, there's so many ways into it, but you weren't supposed to be there, like, after dusk, but I was training for a trail running marathon and I had a day job, so I had to find a place to do that. And this worked out really well because the Lower Hillsborough Wilderness Preserved area is, it's beautiful, but it's also rather hostile. <laughs> and uh, mostly only mountain bikers and like day hikers would, would use it. There's like, it's a wetland, it's Central Florida, so there's a lot of critters and mosquitoes. I literally had a full body mosquito net that I would wear when training. Anyway, so I felt pretty safe, and I was safe for years. I, I spent almost a decade training running around in that area. It's pretty big. Uh, and, but over time, I got somewhat familiar with the geography of it. I'm, anyway, so the other thing I reported to you was the, uh, the, the white creature or pale creature that I encountered one time only. Um, I didn't call this one in because you're a cricket show, but I've since heard stories similar, so I thought I'd share pretty much one of the only weird things that ever, has ever happened to me. I'm not sensitive, blah, blah, blah. Weird things don't happen to me. That's why I enjoy your show, because I get to hear the cool things that happen to other people. But this did happen to me. It was during a, it was a, a weekday. It was in daylight. There was a parking area. I had parked my car. And there was no other cars there. And then another car pulled in, and it was a couple that got out. They were going to be behind me. So when I hit the trail, they appeared to be, like, walking or something like that. There was no visible sign that there was anybody in front of me on the trail. I mean, I guess I was a couple of miles in, in an area where, and this would be, oh, by the way, this would be the Flatwoods area right off of I-75. That's the park portion of the preserve that I was at. The area I'm running through is low, dense palmetto scrub. If you're not familiar with that, when I say dense, it's like unnavigable. You know, you you need to have like high boots because the, you know, it's sharp and there's going to be like all kinds of critters in there. Anyway, and it's also, you know, this is a, a warmer part of the year, so it's a little wet. It's rather, you know, it's not flooded, but it's, it's wet. I'm running through this area and I see something cross the trail in front of me. And I'm trying not to embellish my memory here. It appeared to be sort of a, like it had a two-dimensional quality, but it was, it was a figure, it was tall, it was walking. But this um, figure, I immediately, was, the impression I got was this figure was wearing a, like a, a heavy coat. And I used to categorize this as a hat man because of this. This figure had a hat, but it wasn't a fedora or a pork pie or anything. It was like a floppy hat like a, I don't know, a pillowy type hat. Um, and it was as tall as a man. I'm five foot three, so this, this figure was, uh, by my perception, taller than me and, and maybe 60, 70 yards ahead, crossed the trail in front of me and then into, went into the scrub and then as it passed a tree, it no longer continued. It stopped behind a tree is what it appeared to be the case. And that behavior, to me, read as, why are you stopping there? Are you waiting for me to cross by you? This was, like, dangerous, right? Is this a, a dude hiding behind a tree waiting for me to run past? So I, knowing the area pretty well, immediately took a right and took a little side, like, bushwhacky situation all around that in order to avoid this figure. Okay, so my brain said it was a man in a heavy coat and a floppy hat. Where are the details, like... What was the fabric? I saw no deep. It was a black shadow. It was like a, there were no colors or details of this figure. I said, that's weird. And then I thought, wait a second. Nobody crossed. There's no way to cross into that without gear. You can't walk into that dense palmetto scrub. So it's just as I, I'm running and thinking that didn't, that not, this doesn't make sense. I become less scared because I realize, I know, I know I didn't imagine anything because my, my nervous system read that as, you know, a threat. This was a real thing. This never happens to me. I've never been, had that concern. I'm not running like in this like hyper aware state all the time. I'm familiar with my surroundings and I know I picked up on something 
that I saw. But as I unpack it, as I'm taking my little bushwhacked around, I'm going, this doesn't make sense. Nobody's going to cross there. And how could a guy that big hide behind the tree? I saw him hide behind. It just logically didn't come together. Anyway, I finished my loop around, rejoined that trail, and go to the end of it. Oh, go to the, the end I had arbitrarily picked out. It didn't have an end. It kept going and going forever. I, I come back that way and run through that same area on that on that little trail, and there's there's nobody, of course. There's nothing behind the tree, and I re-examine, well, scan is probably better, the scrub. I'm like, there's just the people, nobody's going to walk into that in, in regular, you know, I don't know what kind of footwear. Honestly, I didn't really look at the figure's feet, but it just, you're just not going to walk into that without it making noise, splashing, and I just, so... I get back to my car, and I'm thinking, okay, what was that? It's pretty cloudless. I mean, was it a plane shadow, maybe? No. I mean, you. another person might tell, decide that what I saw was a plane shadow, but I know that the two or three seconds I had to pick up the details on the figure I saw was it was a, a man in a heavy coat and a floppy hat, but it was a, like a flat, a two-dimensional shadow that crossed the rail in front of me, and it doesn't make any sense. And I know that, and I have no other witnesses, but that's my story. Those are the two things that happened to me in the years that I ran those trails, mostly in the early morning, like hours and hours before sunrise. But this particular time happened to be during the daylight hours. And it was the white creature in the cops of trees, and then this the shadow thing that happened. Anyway, so that's it. I don't know if that's useful to you at all. I hope I gave you enough details. I think I did. Anyway, I love the show. Finally did sign up on Patreon. Should have done it a long time ago, but at least I'm being good now. And uh, looking forward to hearing the next episode. Bye. Thank you, Elisa. And a huge thanks for the Patreon support. I hope you're still with us to hear your story played tonight. Now, I'm wondering if the two experiences Elisa had were possibly connected. She had mentioned the hat man, which, given the description, would fit the bill. But there's another monster, a local monster to the state, that may also be a viable suspect. You see, the skunk ape, which we all know as Bigfoot's skinnier, stinkier, and ornerier cousin from the swamps of the south, and these creatures are said to be dark brown to black and covered in matted hair. So perhaps the coat that Elisa saw was in fact that heavy matted hair. And the hat, you ask, well could that have been something the creature used to keep the mosquitoes Elisa mentioned at bay? Perhaps a head wrap of seaweed or moss or something of the like. But what about the white creature? How does that tie into all this? Well, any longtime listener of this show has undoubtedly heard the frequent reports of a white Sasquatch-like creature in various parts of the country. Now, assuming it can happen there, I think it's safe to assume that it can also happen in Florida. Either that, or perhaps it's the same dark creature, but covered in sand or clay. Another attempt to stay mosquito-free. But the description of the entity ducking behind a tree is what planted this seed in my head in the first place. It's something reported by many eyewitnesses over the years. But, like Elisa, I also see that as a threatening position. And I think she did the right thing by staying alert and diverting her route. As scary as the idea of a skunk ape is, the real-life threat of another human being is all too real. So thank you again, Elisa, for sharing that story. Now our next one takes us north a few states. This is Brad's entry from North Carolina. Hey Derek, my name's Brad. I live in North Carolina and I, I was listening to your back to school special and it got me thinking about some of the strange experiences I had at my church here in Winston-Salem. I started going there when I was probably, I think I was in sixth grade, so I was early teens maybe but i had been going there for a couple months at this point when after youth i would go up to the sanctuary and wait for my parents to pick me up but this time when i was going up through some of the old it was sort of basically classrooms i guess you would call them all the lights were out and at the end of the hallway there were these 
two double doors and there was light coming out from under them. And so as I'm walking down this dark hallway, I see someone walk in front of the door. But the only way I could see them is that their feet were casting a shadow because of the light coming under the door. Well, I stopped and I was like, hey, you know, you know, because it's dark, so I didn't want to scare the person. And when I did, the door opened and there was no one there at all. So I'm like, okay, I guess the church is haunted. And so the next week when I go to youth, I go to my youth pastor and I told him about it. And I'm like, do you think his church is haunted? And he goes, oh, that's just Frank. And so he tells me that when he stays there at night, because he's the last one to leave because he locks up the church, he says that on the old end of the church, which has been there since like 1909, he says that downstairs in the daycare, because the youth room's right above the daycare, he can hear doors opening and closing. And when he's down there locking up, he'll hear someone walking around behind him. And he said he's seen like a shadow person before running between the doorways down there. And so my friends and I are like, oh, sweet we can you know go ghost hunting and stuff but it's probably the scariest time that we ever experienced anything we weren't even looking to find anything we had gone to the fellowship hall where he supposedly like stayed and when you walked in there was a light switch on the right and then it opened up into this fellowship hall and on the left there was a kitchen and then there were stairs going upstairs and towards like the ac unit and stuff for the churches so my friend and i we go to get this mop that's in the kitchen and when we get up to the door, all the lights are off in there. And so, you know, me and him are, don't want to go in there with the lights off. And so we decided to play rock, paper, scissors for who has to go in. But as we're sitting there, you know, like playing rock, paper, scissors, you hear this like banging coming from where the AC is. And I'm like, oh, it's probably just, you know, starting up, you know, it just kind of freaked us out a little bit. But I ended up losing. So I walked in there and turned the lights on. And me and him, you know, go to the left and we go in the kitchen and shut the door. And the door in there is like one of those old doors you see in high schools usually where it has like just that small window there on like right above the door handle. Well, he and I were sitting there, you know, grabbing the mop and we hear the door to the AC room open and someone running, like just running down the stairs like boom, 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 boom. So me and him freeze up and we look towards the door. And when we do, we hear someone just running right up to the door and it gets up to the door and then it was it was a man like but it was black not like skin color i mean he's just it was just the shape of a man and he's just like this black figure just appeared in the window of the door and so he and i just dropped the mop and there's a door that goes right outside from the kitchen me and him just bust through that door and run out and we go up to youth uh hall and go to talk to my youth pastor. We're like listen we're i know we got to clean something up but we're not going back there right now. And he was like, why'd you see Frank? And we were like, yes, we saw a shadow person. He was like, he's like, yeah, I've seen it a couple of times. I'm pretty sure that's Frank, but I figured I'd share that. I have a, a lot more stories from that church and a graveyard that I usually go to, but I'm really enjoying the podcast and uh, hope you hear the story on it. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. You know, I always get a kick out of it when someone says so matter of factly that they know the particular ghost in question. My grandma always did this. Whenever something strange would happen in her house, she would always and quickly blame someone named Charlie. But I won't bore you with that story again. Instead, I'll leave this story with one final thought. I've often heard of more than one entity infesting a home. The friendly, protective ghost versus an evil, nefarious shadow entity. That seems to be the classic combo. So is it possible that Brad's church is home to more than just Frank? I suggest he do some digging on the building's history. I'm sure the answers are in there somewhere. And thanks again for sharing the entry. Now next up, we toss it over to Jordan in the state of Indiana. He's got a double header waiting for us. Hi, Derek. This is Jordan Schmel from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Love your podcast. I binge listen every day. So I have two short stories. One took place probably about 10 to 12 years ago. It was probably around 10.30 to 11.30 in the morning. And I've been up for a few hours 
already at this point. It was on a Saturday, I believe. And uh, I went to go to the restroom to, you know, get ready for the day, do my hair, brush my teeth and everything. And the, our door was open and something just walked past the bathroom door. It was probably about six and a half, maybe seven foot at the most. Um, it was dark green, but I only saw it for a split second. But I knew what I sort of saw, and it happened so fast, I was in complete shock. I stood there for a good four or five minutes. I mean, I could move, but I couldn't leave what I thought I saw. I don't know if it was supernatural or not. After I thought it was my brother at first, and I went downstairs and asked my mom at this point, and she said that he was gone. The only person in my house was my mom, and she was in the laundry room at that point. But that was all I know about this. If anyone has any other experiences close to this or similar, please ease my mind on that. And my second story was about four and a half years ago. Um, this was after my mom passed of cancer. She passed away in our living room, in her sleep. And uh, a couple weeks before she passed, she said that she saw dead people, you know, all around her. And I have uh, I have two nephews at that time, but the youngest nephew was two at the most. And he was, he was in our basement sleeping at this time. So he was not around us that evening. And so he, the next morning he, <clears throat> he um, gives me the chills. But uh, he told his mom the next morning that he could see dead people just like my mom could. So his grandma, which I thought that was really creepy, gave me the chills, it still does. Those are my two short stories that I, I have that were creepy, maybe not supernatural, but very creepy in my opinion. Thank you. And once again, I enjoy your podcast and thank you for everything you do. Thanks, bye. Thank you, Jordan. I gotta be honest here. Your first experience doesn't sound too dissimilar from Christian's that we heard at the head of the show. The only difference being that Christian's ghost eventually manifested itself into a human-shaped entity. So I suppose you should consider yourself lucky, Jordan, that you only saw the blob form and not the full-bodied apparition. Thanks again for the entry. And here we are, folks. The final call of the episode. This one is not really paranormal, per se. But that doesn't stop it from being downright blood-chilling. So please welcome Nate from the state of Ohio to the program. Hey, Derek. This is Nate from Ohio. And I got a story to tell you today about something a couple months ago. Uh, me and my co-worker, we took a little hike out on this place in Ohio. It's called uh, Caesars Creek State Park. I'm going to preface this story by telling you that I've always been somebody that's enjoyed nature, and I've always felt pretty close to nature. And uh, me and my wife actually somewhat practice Wiccan. We have some Wiccan practices, and uh, so we have a pretty strong respect and close relationship with nature. So that comes up in the story. So anyway, me and my friend are hiking through uh, Caesars Creek State Park. It's actually on a section of the Buckeye Trail, which goes all the way around Ohio, but this is just a small section of the trail. So uh, me and my friend are hiking around, and we're having a good time. We're taking our packs out, and we're just going everywhere we can, climbing different things. We go off trail on the beach, and then we 
you know, we cut through and just do some fun stuff. And uh, we come across one of the ridges of the Buckeye Trail, and we pass through it, and then we go through the second ridge. There's two ridges of the Buckeye Trail through Cedars Creek State Park. There's two big ridges that come up to a point, you know, so you can see over the lake and stuff. So whenever we go on this second ridge, we start passing it just to see how, when we're going to stop and maybe make lunch or something. But as we're continuing off to the right, there's this patch of trees that for some reason, we both had this feeling sort of simultaneously, but we, we were just noticing these trees. It seemed, it seemed different. It was a little bit darker than the other trees, a little thicker than other areas of the woods. But I really noticed an ominous feeling. I remember saying those words is, it's this patch of trees for some reason feels really ominous. I remember saying that to my friend. But we continue walking, and as we walk up to the trees, we, you know, we kind of pass them as we walk. You know, we turn our heads to keep watching the trees, because, and I keep saying, man, something just seems super ominous about this section of trees here. I don't know what it is. There's something about these trees. So instead of just walking away like, you know, normal people might, <laughs> we decide to walk a little closer. I say, hey, you know, why don't we just, you know, kind of go in here, see what's going on with these trees. Maybe there's you know, something going on or, you know, I, I don't know. So we go walk in these trees and nothing happens really. You know, we're just walking around and it doesn't seem so bad. And we start to think, you know, hey, we should probably start heading back or uh, let's check out to have lunch or something. So we start trying to find a place to sit down and have our lunch. So we decide to go back to the middle of the ridge where we can see over the lake and we can still see the trees, but we're, we're still we're still not very far from the trees. We're you know, there's maybe a quarter mile between the end of the, it's not the end of the trail, but where we can see the trail turn off. So we didn't go that way. We decided to go in the trees and come back out. So we didn't go to where the trail turned off. But so we go back to sit on the ridge and eat our lunch. And we eat our lunch. We just have a good time talking. And then when we're done eating our lunch, we can see a man coming out from the trail where it turned off that we didn't go that direction. We see a man coming in our direction. So we think, okay, here comes this man. Uh, do you want to pack up our lunch and maybe just head out? That way, you know, we can get in front of him so we don't have to pass him or, you know, slow him down or anything like that. So we decide to pack up our lunch and we start walking on the trail. And while we're walking on the trail, we're not thinking anything. We're talking to each other, telling each other jokes and, you know, whatnot. And uh, I can't remember what the joke was or anything that specifically he said. But he told me this joke, and then so I said some funny quip back. And when I did, we laughed. Whenever we laughed, the guy laughed behind us. So we don't know how fast he was walking before, but he was pretty far back there. But he must have started walking faster. So when we were talking to each other laughing, he audibly, like purposefully and forcefully let out a fake laugh to mock us when we were laughing. And... That was ominous enough. We thought that was weird. So we kind of looked at each other out of the corner of our eyes, but kept on walking and kind of stayed silent for a minute because we were like, that was weird, right? So um, we're just walking in silence, and the guy's, you know, he's a little further back there still. He's 50 feet back behind us or something still. So my friend decides, you know, we just decide not to talk a whole lot or whatever. We talk quietly to ourselves. Maybe we didn't want to agitate the guy because that was weird that he laughed at us. So, so my friend gets something in his mouth or whatever, so he just decides to spit off to the side of the trail so when my friend spits off to the side of the trail the man copies him and spits off to the side of the trail again in an audible spit like to you know like to say Puh, you know what i mean like at us he spits like audibly so that we can hear it and we look at each other again and this time we say to each other hey that you know what i mean what what, what do you think what do we do and you know we kind of just say keep walking but so we're walking, and this guy, he's kind of closing in, but he's hes an older gentleman. You know, I can see gray hair, not really too many details. He's still kind of far back there, but whatever. So we keep walking. So he, he mocked us laughing at us. Then he spit off to the side of the road to mock us again. But then we keep walking, and we try not to think anything of it. And as we're walking, all we start to hear is... And he's running. This man is running we both spin around and this man is full on sprinting at us so he's wearing an army jacket he's wearing blue jeans and boots this man was not in jogging attire 
and he was an older gentleman. We could see his wide eyes. His eyes were wide as could be, wide, angry, red face. He was an older gentleman with gray hair, but he was wearing, like, longer gray hair almost to his shoulders, but he was wearing a black cap as well. But he was sprinting at us like he was ready to tackle us. So he was running at us with a tackle stance. He was running straight at us, and we're two grown men. Like, we're not big or nothing, but we're two grown men. And he is running at us, angrily faced, staring at us, not blinking. He's just, he's coming. So I turn around. I don't know what to do. I already have my hand, like, on my knife. And my friend, I don't, you know what I mean? He pulls his hand out of his pockets, you know, not, not fisticuffs, but he pulls them out ready to, you know, do whatever he has to do. And we split apart, and the man comes, like, right in between us. And I don't know what to do. I, I, I want to see what he's thinking. So I say, hey, man. He, just like that, I say, hey, man. And he doesn't blink. He doesn't flinch at all. He just keeps running. But we split up, and he just ran straight through us. Just straight through us, an inch between us. He runs straight through us. And he keeps running for another 50 feet or so. He just keeps running. And we look at each other, and we're like, oh, what, what the hell is wrong with this guy? So we don't know what we did. We don't we don't have any idea, but the story's not over, Derek. The story is not over. So after he gets 50 feet ahead of us, we're ready. We're like, dude, that was weird. I'm ready to, you know, is he? what's he going to do? Is he done? We don't know what's going on. But so he keeps walking, and he finally stops running, and he keeps walking. So when he's walking, we're sitting there walking. We're kind of looking down. I got my knife in my hand now. And my friend, he, you know, we're, we're just ready to drop our bags and do whatever we got to do. But so he keeps walking way up ahead of us. And then what, what we notice is the trail actually kind of forks. So where the trail forks, he decides to take a right turn. So he takes a right turn off the trail. So when he takes his turn, he disappears into the trail that goes off into the trees. And we're like, okay, cool. We're not going that way. So... We, we think we're fine, and we're walking, and we're just laughing, you know, how, how freaking weird this was. This guy just did this. As we're walking and talking and laughing, we see somebody coming on the trail towards us, in front of us. They're coming towards us. It's a person riding a horse. So this person is riding a horse coming off the other trail that the man didn't go on. So they're coming from the other trail. But what then happens is the man steps out of the tree line. What happened was... He was waiting like he was waiting for us to just pass where he was sitting because there's no way if he went off that trail, that trail goes on forever. He did not go walking on the trail and go about his business because as soon as those people came with the horse on the trail, he came out from the tree line and he was mad. You could see him kicking and you could see him rip, ripping his head and throwing his fist in a little, in a little bit of a tantrum when those people with the horse came and... He was, he was mad that they came on that trail, and luckily they did, otherwise we would have passed him, and who knows what he was waiting for, to jump us out of the trees, or what he was doing, we don't know. Luckily those people came on the horse, but then they turned on the trail that he was sitting on. So when they turn off the trail, and he doesn't know what else to do because he's just been witnessed by someone else, he starts walking back towards us. But instead of walking back towards us on the trail that we are, the horse trail continues about 20 feet down on the bottom of the ridge instead of walking on the top. They don't want the horses walking on the top of the ridge. So he starts walking on the horse trail on the bottom of the ridge, but not, <laughs> it's still, it's not over yet. He's, when he's walking towards us, cussing, throwing his fists, staring at us, he picks up a rock and he tosses it up at us, up the ridge, up a hill, up the inclined hill. He tosses a rock up at us. And we're just like, oh my God, this is about to happen. We're about to, we're about to have to fight this old man, and maybe, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. But he's cussing, kicking, and he's tossing a rock up at us. And then, all of a sudden, we're just like, okay, maybe he'll just keep walking, and we'll cross each other on the different paths that we're on, and it'll be fine. But instead, he beelines it. He goes up the hill. Like, right whenever we're about to cross, instead of just continuing, he beelines up the hill and crosses straight over, like, the divide. He just comes straight up the hill at us, staring at us, coming up the hill like like a freaking football player, still mad. He's coming at us. And, we, like, 
We don't even know. We, we don't know what to do. I'm ready. My knife is in my hand. It's ready to go. And my friend, he's got his, he's got his fist clenched, you know, hanging at his side. We're still walking, trying to be, like, maintain our composure as humans. And this guy, whenever he gets to the point where he's, like, about to be at us, in our face, at that point, he just decides to cut to the, cut to our backs, and he just continues going. He just continues walking, and that's the end of that. He just continued walking, you know, kicking his little feet, and he put his fist in his hand, in his pockets, and man, we got back, we got back to the car, and I was like, dude, I gotta go to the ranger station, I gotta tell them about this guy. So we did, I called the ranger station, and we told them about this character, and oh man, I've just never seen anybody do anything like that again. And to this day, you know, whenever we first started this story, I told you about the trees and the ominous feeling we had. And the more that we thought about it, we thought, you know, was it the trees giving us the ominous feeling? Were the trees ominous? Or were the trees warning us? Because this was a whole conversation before this man. So, you know what I mean? It could just been a crazy guy in, you know, a dark forest. But then the thing is, was it the trees that made the man angry at us? You know, if you want to go to, if you want to go the spiritual route, was it the trees, the, the ominous spirit and the trees that went to the man? Or I, I kind of feel like it was nature telling us, just giving us the feeling, hey, you shouldn't be here, turn around, go back, something bad's about to happen. And that's kind of the feeling that I have now in retrospect is like maybe the trees were just trying to tell us, hey, this is a bad place and time for you guys to be in the universe. This place for you to be in the universe is dangerous right now. And I feel like maybe that's what it was. And uh, I know a lot of callers, you know, have, you know, paranormal things and maybe they also have the same experience. But thank you. I hope you can use this. Love the podcast. Thank you, Nate. You know, something about this story reminds me of another about a maniac in the Ohio woods and a serial killer that ruined the outdoors for me for many years. Quite literally. Southern Ohio's rural counties are perfect for outdoor recreation. But the calm of this quiet community was shattered in 1989 when a sniper gunned down an outdoorsman without reason. It was only the first in a string of random, terrifying murders. Hiding in the distance, behind a high-powered rifle, a madman was hunting humans along Ohio's county roads. Starting in the spring of 1989, a madman prowled the woods and fields of rural Ohio. He was a hunter. A high-powered rifle was his weapon of choice. Joggers and fishermen were his quarry. The hunter roamed far, struck at random, and left no clues. He was as elusive as he was lethal. Investigators knew he had to be stopped, but no one knew how. The killer was Thomas Lee Dillon, and between the years of 1989 and 1992, he stalked the rural back roads of Ohio, picking off outdoors types with a sniper rifle. All in all, he killed five people, one each from the following Ohio counties. Tuscaroras, Belmont, Muskingum, Coshocton, and Noble. Now, if you glance at a map of Ohio counties, you'll see that those counties surround one other singular county. A county that just so happens to be the one that I grew up in. Guernsey County. Now, looking back, my parents were right to keep us close to the house during these years. The pattern certainly looks like Guernsey might have been the next county he struck in. Now, eventually, this monster was caught and sentenced to 150 years and later died in 2011 of an undisclosed illness. I hope a painful one. But I still remember those years, when each time we wandered outside, we wondered if we'd run into the closest thing I could think of, the true evil. Oh, and the clip about Dylan is courtesy of Human Prey, the FBI Files and the full episode can be found in tonight's show notes. Thanks again, Nate. Thankfully, your experience was less dire than any of Dylan's victims, but still terrifying, nonetheless. And that's going to do it for this episode. Monsters Among Us Beyond is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. 
All audio used in this production is done so under the protection of fair use. The terrifying score that you hear is White Bat Audio and Co.ag Music. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for the support. And until next time. <laughs>